Welcome everyone this, to this edition of Going Deep with me, Richard Mills. Our guest this edition is the inspiring Darlene Berberabe. She had just a fantastic career, both in the private sector and later on in the public sector, where she became a national figure with running as CEO of the Peg Ibig organization. And she just has a remarkable story of success and uh, achievement. So please welcome Darlene Berberabe to Going Deep with me, Richard Mills. So glad to have everyone here with us today for Going Deep with me, Richard Mills. And we have just a remarkable guest today, Darlene Berberabe. Quite a tremendous career with uh, Peg Ibig. She became a national figure during her time as CEO of this large organization, but also had a quite a strong career in the private sector as well for many years. So glad to have her today, Darlene Berberabe. Welcome to the show. Thank you, Richard. Thank you very much for having me, for thinking of me. Uh, I am, of course, uh, missing all the activities that you've been uh, doing for, for our nation. I'm a fan of you and Rebecca for the Asia CEO events, and, and I've been involved uh, with those events as well. So I'm here, um, uh, excited to share my story with you. Wonderful. Well, Darlene, maybe if you could tell us just a little bit for people who don't know you, just a little bit about your background and the kinds of things you've done in your career in life. Sure. Okay. <clears throat> so I'm a lawyer by profession. Okay. So I um, I started being in the academe. So I, I have a background in philosophy. And uh, when I graduated, I graduated with a with, with honors in the University of the Philippines. At that time, there was no female philosophy uh, professor being accepted in the faculty of the University of the Philippines. Okay? But uh, because uh, I, I graduated with, with, a, with high honors, uh, I applied and uh, just tried my luck, and they accepted me. And so I became the first um, female philosophy professor in, the, in UP Diliman. Okay. Now, so that was a big thing in the, in the academe. So I was about really to study my law uh, the, the year after. So what I did was to defer my, my studies uh, in law and went uh, to a full-time teaching. So I taught philosophy for 10 years. Uh, five years of the, of the 10 years, I studied a law school uh, on a part-time basis. And then when I finished law, uh, I became an associate lawyer in an international law firm based here in Manila. And then I spent about uh, almost five years in, in that law firm. And then uh, I went uh, to the private sector, uh, Procter & Gamble. I became the chief legal officer of Procter & Gamble. And then I was so happy there. I thought I was going to retire in PNG. Uh, I had uh, a blast in PNG. I'm a png -er forever. But in 2010, I got an invitation from uh, the Vice President of the Republic of the Philippines. At the time, Vice President Minai, who was given the housing uh, portfolio for the, for the government. Uh, so he was looking for a president for Pag-ibig Fund. And then he invited me to at least just uh, give my CV to the president of the Philippines. And then uh, I said, sir, I, I wasn't sure. I'm, I'm, I'm happy in PNG. And, and he was, he actually joked uh, with me and he said, you know, just send your CV. The president might not appoint you anyway. So just send it. So I said, okay. So I, I sent my, my CV. But, and that weekend, the following weekend, the appointment papers came out. I told the vice president, sir, I don't know anything about housing finance. He said, I don't know either. Let's study together. And uh, it was a start of um, my career in the executive uh, 
in an executive role. So I was a chief legal officer from my last role in PNG and then became a CEO of an organization of a government financial institution. It had 5,000 employees. And um, during the first year, I learned a lot. I really tried to learn quickly. <clears throat> and the rest is history. So it was like uh, uh, the, the, the next um, a little over six years was really a lot of learning and a lot of service and a lot of fulfillment as well for a um, for a, uh, a simple person who never uh, dreamed of landing in that CEO role. My my trap was different, but I am up to now very grateful for that opportunity and honor to be of service to the Philippines. It was quite an interesting thing. I remember watching you with the, what was it, Senate hearings and so forth, and you really conducted yourself in a very professional, high-level uh, manner. But so but before we get to do that, can we go back to Procter & Gamble? Now, for people who maybe don't know, this is a large global organization with a good history or a good track record of developing talent. Um, it's always been one of their, uh, their part of their, their reputation. But now what was the, the progression that you started off as a, I guess, junior lawyer? Or what, what were you doing in Procter & Gamble? And what was the progression that got you to be the, the chief legal officer for the organization? Okay. <clears throat> the, uh, Procter & Gamble is a very lean organization. So when you say uh, uh, PNG legal, so there was one person that was in charge of um, of the three companies that PNG had in the Philippines. So it has a plant in, in Cabuyao. It has two offices that are based in Metro Manila. Uh, and it was uh, those three companies are in charge of the Procter & Gamble operations in the Philippines. So uh, there was a, uh, the chief legal officer of, of PNG then was already uh, looking at succession planning because he was about to retire in a few years. And then his um, number two was about to be sent to a regional role. Okay, So in PNG, it is uh, a lot of moving. It is a lot of assignment in other countries if you want to go up the ladder. And so they were already looking for someone to lead uh, the Philippine operations. So they got me as a junior lawyer. So I was, uh, the designation was a senior manager in the legal department. So we were three lawyers. And, uh, and um, soon, uh, in a few years, the, the head retired. And then maybe uh, in, in three years time, so they, they promoted me to be the uh, member of the leadership team for the Philippines and uh, the chief uh, legal for, for the Philippines. I see. And now Procter & Gamble, how big an operation is uh, Procter & Gamble in the Philippines, Darlene? Okay, so uh, we had, um, I think, uh, 1,000 employees. So the, uh, the, the plant had the most number of employees. Uh, we also had the backroom company of Procter & Gamble here in the Philippines, uh, which I think was also led by Oka San Sanyes, our friend. Uh, back in the two, 2000. So that backroom company is serving a lot of Procter & Gamble uh, offices all over the, uh, the world. And then it had a, dis a distribution company. Uh, it had a, a, a unique corporate structure in the, in the region. And, and so there was a lot of coordination of the Philippine market with the rest of uh, Southeast Asia. Yeah. Uh, and Asia Pacific. So um, the legal officer was, the chief legal officer will uh, also be the legal for all the three companies. And uh, it was a lot of, we were also given regional assignments. Yeah. So for example, there were uh, legal matters that were assigned to market uh, lawyers, uh, meaning market, lo market lawyers, meaning on ground, on ground a, a specific country, but uh, there were a lot of uh, collaboration and, and synergy. And so 
um, the lawyers for each country could be given assignments which pertain to uh, regional matters as well. Interesting. So were you ever posted in other countries, uh, Darlene, or did you stay here while you, but you must have traveled uh, as okay. well? Okay, that's a very um, interesting question for me now. I, I, I am recalling what happened. In fact, in 2009, so I, I joined PNG in 2004, and then in 2009, my boss was already telling me, you know, um, we we have you have a lot of promise. Your career has a lot of promise here in PNG. I think that the next step for you is to be exposed to the regional people, uh, and then so in 2009. I was already traveling back and forth to Singapore because I was going to be posted in Singapore for the for my next regional role. Uh, we were already negotiating with my with my package, and then uh, we had an election in 2010. So I was there. There was one year that I was already preparing my daughter. So I have my one and only daughter. So we were up. I was also about to uproot her. So we were preparing. Uh, and uh, of course, she has to leave the school. She has to go to an international school, which was going to be paid for as well by Procter and Gamble. They op- they were offering a very good package, uh, take making sure that we will be able to adjust as well in, in Singapore. So it was one year of preparation, Richard. And my daughter was uh, willing. She said, "Okay, I'm I'm willing to go. Of course, mom, with you." And I was excited to start my career there. Um, I thought I was going to uh, go up the wealth ladder as well because uh, PNG is a, um, is a, a very good company. And then when the vice president uh, said, uh, okay, there's a role, a CEO role, and uh, then the president of the Philippines um, issued the appointment, there was right away a an emergency meeting of the leadership team of Procter and Gamble, and I was already excluded in the email distribution list of that leadership uh, team email. And they said, and they were they already uh, were preparing. Okay, what do we do now? So we're we're losing Lelen, but of course we're losing her to to the government. So which could also be a uh, a contribution of the company as well to nation building. And uh, so I moved to government. So, but I was about to be posted in, in Singapore as well. That's interesting. And that they looked upon it as a, a contribution to nation building. It seems to me there's been a lot of really good senior leaders created by this organization. You mentioned Oscar Sanez, who did a tremendous contribution with uh, IBPAP. Uh, establishing that as a, as a real world class operation, um, and others. What is maybe I, just to sidetrack a bit, but what is it about Procter and Gamble that you think um, enabled this? Okay, Procter and Gamble. When when I look at the 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 company itself, when when there are global meetings, I would say that while P and G is run like. A, a very evolved country as well. So it, it was really, uh, I viewed it as one country and they were very strong in value for values formation, uh, very strong on professionalism, on integrity. And when they are present in a country, they are also very strong on, uh, okay, how can we help? How can we contribute to the to nation building of the country where they are uh, present? So, uh, aside from family background, aside from my education, I would say that the training of PNG on these values is really so effective that professionals who are alumni of PNG and uh, whom I see in other fields, they continue to have those values and really uh, be champions of those values. Integrity being, I think, one of the most critical. So I learned so much there that uh, integrity means uh, doing the right thing when no one is looking or especially when no one is looking. 
and mm-hmm. it it was so uh, important for for me who was about to move to government because of course i had a lot of prejudices as well i i i uh, i was in doubt whether you know my personality uh, could i adjust well in in this kind of uh, environment in the government so but you know i just stayed true to the values that i had in me and strengthened by the the companies that i joined before and and so i think uh, the the professionals uh, Johnny Kuwa, who was our general manager, uh, even the, the last uh, uh, American general manager of Procter & Gamble, also had strong affinity with uh, the Philippines. He con- Even now, he is like CEO in a company based in Dubai. His name is Jim Lafferty. He, he continues to uh, contribute to the uh, development of the Philippines by mentoring and uh, training our athletes who are uh, Olympic qualifiers. So uh, I know that Jim Lafferty was like a, 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 a member of the Circle of Excellence in Asia CEO, I think, in one of the expat uh, uh, awards. So so you're correct in your observation. So I'm, I'm very proud of the alumni of uh, PNG and, of course, the organization itself. Sure. And yes, I, I do remember I met Jim. I didn't know him very well, of course, but he had, had a good reputation. Um, now, Darlene, consumer goods over to home loans for the government, that's quite a, quite a jump. How did you become pointed out for that, that role, uh, Darlene? Okay. So I, I was also wondering, and I had that conversation with the, with the vice president, because uh, Vice President Binay did not know me personally, so he knew he knew of me uh, because his chief of staff then was my brother-in-law, and my my brother-in-law would always talk about the members of the family. These are the credentials. So uh, vice president just heard uh, that this this is my background. So he he know, he knew that I was a graduate of the University of the Philippines Law School, which he is also a graduate uh, of. And then he knew my background in Procter and Gamble, and he also uh, he also couldn't explain fully why. So he 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 just liked the what he heard about my credentials and track record. And then he asked me, and then in fact I told him, sir. Uh, uh, have you also heard that I am um, one, I, I am the most hard to approach among the siblings, meaning, you know, if if you have a favor to ask, I have to ask a lot of questions as well. So not because you're the vice president, I will have to probe first. And then he told me, surprisingly, he told me, that's what I need. That's what I need. So uh, let's see, I'll pass on your uh, your resume to the president, and let's see if if he will appoint you. So you are correct. Uh, I have no idea about housing. I have no idea about housing finance. I had only one paralegal in Procter and Gamble, and then moved to a CEO role. Five thousand employees. We had at that time thirty two branches all over the Philippines. Wow. Uh, and uh, we also had around 20 offices in the uh, in the international internationally. So we had like uh, over 20 offices because we were also catering to the OFWs. Oh, I see. Okay. So it it was uh, it was a leap of faith. So. Uh, when, when you move from one role to another without much preparation, so I, I just stuck to uh, my skills and I would, I would attribute it to my skills as a lawyer and as a, philos- a student of philosophy and a professor of philosophy because it was a lot of uh, being humble with what you know, recognizing what you know and what you don't know, and then taking that step of learning, asking the questions, asking the right questions. So I, I was very uh, dependent as well on, the, on my management team. So I, uh, if, 
in order for you to learn the ropes, then you have to ask questions and you have to have good judgment or discretion to choose uh, these are the relevant information and then these are the programs that I think will be, um, will be for the betterment of the organization. So, and uh, we went to Wharton uh, together with the vice president, the team as well of the housing because there were six other agencies. We had a crash course. We, we went there for three weeks. Even the vice president uh, went with us to study. So again, he, he was also very humble and he was uh, saying that, okay, I was given the housing portfolio by, by the president, the government, um, the, the, the housing portfolio isn't that big uh, as indicated by the fact that it is only uh, a few years back that we have a department of housing. So when the government does not have a department, then that means it isn't uh, much a priority. But uh, the vice president uh, willingly embraced the role and he just uh, got the team together. We are going to learn this. And uh, I think that the housing programs of the vice president were the solid programs that he could say was his accomplishment during his uh, time as vice president. Mm -hmm. Now, you know, it, it's public information that before you came in, there had been some concerns with Peg Gibbig. I don't know, a few scandals that I'm not, I'm not saying anything that's not new. This is news. Um, so when you came in, it was at a time when maybe it was ready for change or restructuring. I don't know. But what do you think that you did? I mean, you must have had some interesting experiences. But yeah. what, what do you think you accomplished for the organization in your six years that really made an impact for the nation? Okay, so <clears throat> I could not forget that Senate investigation. So I knew uh, when it was offered to me that it was in the news. So uh, it was offered to me in September. Uh, I mean, it was the very first conversation that we had. Uh, I was asked to submit my, uh, my resume, I think, in, in late October. And then November, I became uh, the president of the Big Fund. Uh, so I was on a, I was on cloud nine. I was of course also very pleased with the trust of the president yes. of the Philippines. Of course, uh, he he also doesn't know me, didn't know me personally. And then a week after my being so happy and pleased with the appointment, I got a summons, uh, and being invited to the Blue Ribbon Committee of the Senate. So that means that when you are invited to a blue ribbon, it's not something to be happy about because it's about corruption. Oh, God. So, and uh, in my office, so the, the officers sent me all the piles of documents that I had to learn, I had to study because I have to answer intelligibly in the investigation. And so obviously you could not uh, just absorb everything so there were we had marathon meetings and uh, I also uh, I, I was also thinking on whether maybe I could be excused because you know I'm new and maybe I could just yeah. deputize someone but I was reflecting and I said you know I am very pleased and honored to have been appointed so the the role uh, uh, with the role are all the um, uh, honor and privilege that you feel, but at the same time, it will also mean that you will have to face all the challenges. And I think it was at uh, a big fund was at a time which was very sensitive and critical as well for the organization because all of them um, and, and uh, many officers, many employees are very honest uh, people and they are also. Uh, demoralized and discouraged. Why is our organization in the news being investigated for corruption? So I thought that it was a, a good time as well uh, that their leader would stand up with them and for them and really have to face the, the grilling of Senator uh, Enrile, who was, I, I think, at the time, uh, I think the head or, or at least part of the Blue Ribbon 
committee. So it was a lot of grilling. Really, I remember uh, being so nervous and I'm already a lawyer. So can, you can imagine when we watch the Senate investigations, it's really nerve wracking. And so sometimes people who testify there, even if they're honest, because of uh, the anxiety, so sometimes you, you cannot think straight. So, and uh, I just, you know, tried to study as much as I can. I'm a, I used to be a law student. I was um, used to reading a lot of uh, volumes of uh, papers, so that's fine. Uh, and maybe I attended two or three meetings. And then uh, after two years, we were summoned again when there were, when there was a new set of senators, so they want the... They wanted still to, to investigate. So it was at the time, Senator Trillanes was the one that was grilling Pag-ibig Fund again. And also at the time, uh, they wanted to investigate Pag-ibig Fund because VP Binay already announced that he wanted to become president and he was going to run for president. And so there was special attention to all the agencies that VP Binay was handling and uh, one was Pag-ibig Fund. So we were summoned again to pag to the Senate for another round of investigation. And, and at the time, so I was two years, three years already in the role. So I couldn't like uh, not know about uh, the answers to their questions. So again, I just stuck to the values, uh, be transparent, um, stick with the facts. I used logic. These are the premises. This is my conclusion. These are my facts. These are the reports. We, we really tried to be as transparent as possible. There were senators who were like badgering uh, me, uh, really rat trying to rattle me. But I guess, you know, when you're, when you're telling the truth, even if you change the articulation of the question, you'll have the same answer. And I would say that um, uh, we were able to defend uh, Pag-ibig Fund because the investigation was concluded. Uh, and unlike in court, there will be like a conclusion that, okay, you're acquitted. In the Senate investigations, they will either be quiet or in the report, there is no finding for the, for the uh, government agency, and which is what happened with Pag-ibig Fund. So, um, no finding of uh, corruption or anomaly in, in, in Pag-ibig Fund. Interesting. Now, I've met uh, Senator Enrile once, and he's quite a strong-willed character. Tr Senator Trillianis also has a strong reputation for his strong-willed, though. How many days of grilling did you endure during these sessions, darling? Okay, in, in the second round, in the second round of the investigation, which was, I think, in 2015, uh, there were, I think, three or four. Okay, so it ran from January to May uh, of that year. So it was really, uh, you know, you, you, you will not wish it for your enemy. Or maybe, maybe I will. <laughs> but, you know, it's, it's really... Um, uh, a lot of stress for for myself and also for the organization because it was a lot of preparation. I really had to. Uh, I did not want to ask my uh, my deputies or my senior vice president or my uh, my vice presidents or managers to come with me because in the first round during the 2010 investigation, so there were a lot of of officers in Pag-ibig Fund that were invited. And most of the people, most of the officers are, are accountants. And when you're accountants, you know, you're used to uh, documents and not really used to uh, public debate or and televised at that. So I thought in the second round in 2015, I thought if there's going to be one spokesperson for, for Pag-ibig Fund, I think it should just be me. Okay, so I had to study also what were the documents that were signed by my managers and vice presidents because if they ask me about it, I don't want to ask oh, ask my manager. So I don't want to involve any other officer. 
because I thought that you know I'm I'm a lawyer. I want to take advantage also of being of being a lawyer. So if they ask me a question, I I have um, an idea of how to phrase it um, re, uh, to capture what I really wanted to say. Yeah, that's uh, interesting. And maybe if I could say, there's still videos online um, during this uh, session, and and it was quite intense. I, I can tell you, I felt for you. I wouldn't say it's entertaining, you know, to watch, but I'd say it was, uh, I don't know what the word is, but it's really interesting to see, you know, politics is, um, it's the nature of, of, of politics. And and so you got, you know, uh, as a CEO of a large private sector organization, you got pulled into it. Um, now, Darlene, maybe if I could ask you, um, you're a bit unique is that you're one of the rare leaders who has successful you know, experience in both the public and private sectors. What do you think are some of the main differences between leading you know, a public sector as opposed to a private sector organization? Okay, in the, in the private sector and my experience in Procter & Gamble, you know, the, the metrics of, for your performance, the metrics for your evaluation are very clear and defined. And you, you can actually uh, demand that from your boss. So we had a lot of one-on-ones. Uh, you could design, you could design, you could define your career track. You could express that. And you will have mentors in the, in the private sector who can help you achieve that. So they, they, encourage, they encourage you to, to visualize where you want to be five years, 10 years down the road. Uh, and then your work, plan is very defined, quarterly evaluation, adjustment if necessary. And then as a member of the uh, uh, leadership team, when I was observing also why the CEO, how the CEO was deciding in, in uh, PNG, each one of the me- each member of the leadership team would give their position, their perspective. And then after all the inputs, the CEO would make a decision. Okay. So, and uh, another factor is uh, all your colleagues were carefully vetted, really professional. And in the private sector, uh, you know the phrase, you are up or out. Okay, So if there is one quarter that your performance dipped, or uh, then uh, sometimes you will be told, okay, uh, this, will, you, this is your performance improvement plan or otherwise you will be able to say as well that okay I don't have a future in in this company so there's a lot of predictability in the private sector so uh, and to me you know it makes it gives an employee a a sense of stability and security now move to the public sector public sector you get appointed uh, I was the only one together with a corporate secretary, another position in the organization. There were two people in Pag-ibig Fund who did not have security of tenure and the CEO being that one other person. So the rest of the organization, they have security of tenure. It's so difficult to remove uh, someone with security of tenure. But for a CEO, I know you would know you're a CEO for that day, but the next day you're not sure. Okay, so there is a lot of uncertainty. Okay, so that is one. Number two, the metrics are not that defined because as a public servant, it is not only Pag-ibig Fund, which is your stakeholder. Your stakeholder, uh, your stakeholders involve all congressmen, all senators, the, the president, the vice president, uh, all the other agencies, and the Filipino people, all the, the OFWs, all the members, the 17 million members of Pag-ibig Fund, all of those are your stakeholders. So uh, it's a lot of accountability. okay? And that's why uh, the definition of integrity that I mentioned a while ago, I think is very important for public servants. So it's important in, in private sector, but here in public sector, the stakeholders get multiplied a number of times and magnified as well. So sometimes you have to do your work in front of the public eye. 
So when so many people are watching, you tend to balance between being very careful, being cautious because so many people are watching. But you also have to be very agile and nimble so that you can make things happen because you're the CEO. So you're not yet paid there to just think and analyze and then you you get paralyzed. So uh, it, because it's a lot of uh, public aspect, that's what differentiates it also from the uh, private sector. And then the third, uh, because... Um, also, it, I, I could say that the compensation program is, is still a work in progress in, in government. So there is also a difference between the people that the private sector can recruit and the people that uh, are recruited in the government service. So if, the, if a private sector company can afford uh, to pay so much for certain kind of talent, well, you, you, you cannot see that in government as well. So that me and I, I wasn't the type of leader who brought all my, all people who I thought were professional from the private sector, pulled them uh, into government. So I did not bring anyone except the, a confidential position, which was my, my chief of staff. And so in government, it, I had to find out as well that, you know, there are good people, and it's just a matter of being able to discern for the CEO, these people are good, and then tap them, encourage them to contribute more, uh, and then set the vision for, for them. So to me, those are the differences, the, at least the, the top differences between the two. Well put, well, uh, well presented. That's, uh, I, that's a very good description of some of the differences. Um, so yeah, so well done. That is quite an interesting story. Now, an, another interesting part of your career was teaching, and you taught for many years at uh, the University of Philippines. Can you, you had a busy schedule doing many things, but you kept that up for, I think, what, 12 years or something like that? Yes. So why? What, what was the, um, I mean, it's fun, I, I guess, but but what was that? What did that add to your career? And, and would you recommend it to others, or was that just a special case for you? Okay, so I'm the type Richard who really does not plan my career. So if you look at my resume, it was like jumping from one role to another. So you, um, so when people ask me, uh, did you plan for this? So I, I'm sorry to say I really am not that kind of a planner. Okay. So the reason why I went to, to um, the teaching was, again, the challenge at the time when I was a student, okay, this department uh, is not accepting female teachers. Why is that? So I studied so hard when I was a student. And then when I graduated with the highest honor, I wanted to check if the department who produced a student with the highest honor is still not good enough for the department to be a faculty member. And thankfully, the chairman at that time was open and really, okay, accepted me. So that was, uh, that was the start of my teaching career. And then when I became a professor of philosophy, Richard, I was at peace. I really like studying. I like, um, I like studying. I like teaching. I like sharing and discussing with students. I thought that uh, if the Philippines could also develop like our academic institutions to really uh, put the right compensation to the faculty members, the uh, uh, being a professor is really something that I would recommend. Of course, for persons who also like to read and study and um, have also the ability to communicate their, their thoughts because that's a different set of skills as well. So um, I also like the, uh, the schedule. So I was teaching full-time, but that meant three hours a day of teaching. And there was like, uh, that was four days of teaching. So one, four days uh, in, in, um, in a week. Uh, that was a good schedule for me. So I thought that 
uh, it was perfect for me who at that time was already starting a family. Okay, so th- so so the schedule really uh, worked um, in that favor. And then uh, even when I became a lawyer, uh, I was asked, I was invited by the dean to teach in the uh, in the College of Law of the of UP as well. So I continued to be a lecturer, a part time lecturer in the. Uh, University of the Philippines. Up to now, I teach. So I teach one subject of law. And because of my love for philosophy, I went back to school again, Richard. I uh, enrolled in the philo- in a doctor of philosophy uh, in philosophy. So I finished my master's in philosophy. And then now I'm, I'm studying for my doctorate. I don't know. Don't ask me if I'm going to finish this. I don't know. Uh, I said during the pandemic, because I uh, found myself reading philosophy again, I said, why not earn units for for this? And so I was trying to look for universities that offered uh, online classes uh, until the end. And then, uh, so I enrolled in in UP to, and so now I'm enrolled. I, uh, I finished six units last semester and uh, on top of my full-time work, I'm, I'm also studying um, now. So uh, teaching has been uh, a good part of my career. So either I, I uh, went through full-time, now I, it's part-time. Why do I do it? I think out of all the work that I do, Richard, this is the most time-consuming. This yeah. is the uh, and the, the least paying, of course, I'm not even thinking of it as a source of income because uh, I work, uh, I teach in a public school. So it's really, I, I think of it as uh, giving back. Number two, um, I, I like the exercise. I like the mental exercise. I like to be always uh, learning something. I, I like the life of a student. So I'm, I'm that type of person. That's very interesting. And so it might be a year or two for you to finish this PhD. And if I can say it's just a fabulous use of time during the pandemic to also build skills for the future. I mean, your situation is a bit unique, but, but you know, it is a, a good example. Um, yeah, okay. That's Now, would you say, so So you've been, okay, so both a, a success, I would say, in the public sector, private sector, and in academia. Is this something, you seem like a hard-driving, you know, success-oriented person. Is, is that a reasonable statement? Is that, uh, <clears throat> what do you think? Okay, I would like to think that uh, uh, I, I really try to, make efficient use of my time. Let's put it that way, Richard. So when I have time, like when I have a a, a day, 24 hours, uh, I view view my day as made up of 24 units, okay? So how many units do I spend for sleeping and rest? How how many units do I spend uh, on work? Uh, how many do I spend with family? And each unit, so each hour of that. So for example, if I am uh, eating dinner with my daughter, I make sure that I am present in that one hour. I make sure that we, I enjoy what I eat and I enjoy the conversation over the dinner. So when I am exercising uh, for 40 minutes, I, I, ex- I try to exercise for six days a week. So to... I'd like to live long, uh, Richard, so I take care of myself. I am going to inherit a lot of uh, diseases or illnesses. So I said, what I'm going to die of should not be my fault. So I take care of myself. So when I exercise, I also try to be uh, fully present in that exercise. So I maximize and that's for my body. So uh, magnify that kind of view to my week, to my month my year so sometimes I look at the life as decades as well so what did you do in your second decade in your third decade in your fourth decade so just a general not really planning specifically but I like to um, I like to be very deliberate in what 
I uh, spend my time with. So when I found extra time because I wasn't traveling uh, to my to offices uh, anymore, so wow, I had like what three hours of or three to four hours every day free time. So I thought, what what am I going to spend this on? And since I was already reading, so I said, okay, let me try to uh, earn units. Uh, you, you were asking how long will it finish a PhD? If you're full-time, maybe you can finish it in three years to four years uh, uh, because there is a comprehensive exam uh, and a dissertation to write. If you are full-time working, then you can count four years up to 11 years to, to finish that. So, so uh, I, I try to maximize. I, I still think that uh, there are th- a lot of things to do, but um, this is what I'm doing now. And, uh, and I, I wouldn't say that, you know, I'm, I have a lot of stress that is not manageable. So I think um, I'm just fine doing so many things and just making sure that my energy is efficiently spent. Superb. Now, Darlene, about yourself, I mean, as a person, how would you describe yourself? Are you introverted, do you think, or extroverted? Were you good at school? I think you were. It sounded like you were. Uh, And were you ever rebellious, or or were you think you're a person who follows the rules? What? How would you describe? Okay. So I'm an extrovert. Uh, uh, So and then I. I am a very good student, so okay. since nursery, so I was already always a, a top student um, since f- uh, five years old. Um, so um, good student in a grade school, high school, college, uh, and then uh, I'm. My heart is from the province, so I, I I'm I'm from Batanga City, so that's what they call in the in the local language, uh, from the that means from the province. Okay. So uh, I'm uh, uh, I want to believe that I have a good sense of humor. Um, mm, I'm hardworking. I am not rebellious. I am uh, a compliant person. So maybe that's why it's so hard for me to be an entrepreneur and maybe also for a lot of Filipinos because the culture is really, you know, when you are raised by your parents, you have to follow the rules, what the parents say, you have to follow. So I'm that kind of person. So even the university, even if I... I was a student in UP, which is really a lot of rallies. So I never joined it. Uh, But um, uh, it's, uh, I'm really a compliant, really a compliant person. (laughs) Okay. And your your, uh, parents, now, did they raise you uh, to be this way? And did you have uh, brothers and sisters to, to help uh, along the way or how did that? Uh... Okay. So we are five children. My father uh, is used to be mayor of Batanga city. So we, oh. I come from a family of uh, politicians yes. and my mom, uh, I think was also success. I could say successful in her career because she's a medical doctor. So she, and at that, during that time, during her time, so it was not, um, not yet common for, for women to really be driven and to pursue yeah. uh, careers uh, post college. So and, and we were raised in, in, the pro- in the province with our clan. So I come from a very big family. My father uh, had uh, they were 17 siblings. Oof. So one seven. So our first cousins are like your 74 co- uh, first cousins. Wow. Just that that's just on the father's side. Mother's side is there were 12 siblings. So, uh, and, and because we were five children, you know, during dinners, it would always be a lot of discussion, a lot of debate. And you have to be assertive in order for the rest to listen to your stories for the day. Yeah. 
<laughs> you have to fight for that slot. So I think that, that was the training in the family. And because, uh, because of the uh, politics uh, background as well, so mm-hmm. three of the five children pursued law. So uh, there are three lawyers in the family. And then there's uh, our, our oldest brother is also a doctor. So he's a surgeon now serving in the Philippine General Hospital. So when you are from the province, so I mentioned that because there's also a, a unique feature of people, of families in the province, children are brainwashed to finish a, um, a, a degree that will, be, that will make you a professional. So for, for, our, for the families in Batanga City, it was very important that you graduate. Like uh, you should be a doctor, you should be a lawyer, you should be an engineer. There should be a title to your name. So that was how we were raised. So uh, early on, I was called Attorney Lelen. So they, they were already calling me Attorney. So and then my brother and then my sister. So I, somehow it was because that was also our exposure. And uh, so most of us really pursued a second course after college. Interesting. That's so quite a high performing family. Well, there, there's a lot of discussion, uh, Lelen, about the, you know, this nature versus nurture um, idea of whether leaders are born or whether they are made. Now, seems like you you got a lot of nurturing, but you've also, you know, you're a driven person. What what do you think? I know it's a sliding scale, but do you think it's more nurture or more nature or what what, what do you think? Okay, okay. I can share with you examples for for my view that it's actually both. It's actually both nature and nurture. There are there are also instances where even if you have a little bit of nature, but a lot of nurture, that could also happen. Yeah. Uh, I'd like to share also my experience with my daughter. Okay, so I have one and only daughter. Because I was a great student, always top uh, in in my class. Somehow I was also observing my daughter. Uh, when she was growing up, so I was I was her tutor in 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 her in her lessons. So uh, in grade school, she she graduated best in sports. She she's into karate, but she wasn't an honor student. Okay, the father uh, was a professional basketball player. So the father is an athlete, and then the mother is like an an academic. I I would you could say. So I said. Okay, so she takes after the father. Okay, so of course I was always uh, I was rationalizing. It doesn't matter as long as you are good in the field that you choose. That's what we. That's what parents want. Okay, so but I continued to nurture to nurture her to tutor her to enroll her in Kumon and uh, I spotted the interventions that she uh, she thought that I thought she needed, so I enrolled her in, in, in classes. Come high school, so she still graduated best in sports, but, and then she, there, there's an addition. So she also graduated with honors. And then I was asking her, uh, are you in the top 20, top 10? So mom, no, maybe top 25. Okay, so I said, okay, so that's an improvement from best in sports now honor and a best in sports. And then Richard, come college, she tells me, mom, I want to save your transcript of grades in my cell phone just for my inspiration. And then I want to study mathematics. Okay. And so I said, okay, so study. And then, and then she was able to enter UP, um, she, stud- she enrolled in BS Mathematics. And then four years after, she graduates summa cum laude in mathematics. And then in the same year, 2019, she, so she was, she was training in karate since, since she was six years old. Hmm. She decided to uh, go back to karate training for the 2019 SEA Games. And she 
won gold medal in karate. So that's my example to you of it wasn't apparent that she was also good in academics, but I would also say, and I maybe other people will say, well, because she was already uh, exposed to uh, the fields of sports and academics or the genes as well, but it's, it's not automatic. So you have to combine both. And uh, it, it wasn't evident for the first 10 years of her life or maybe first 18 years uh, of her life for, for the academics. So it was a lot of patience. And even in, in sports, uh, Richard, in her first three years in karate, she, she was always losing her tournaments. Mm-hmm. And all my family were telling me, why are you forcing her in karate? She's not good there. And I, somehow I just decided, no, we're going to pursue it. And then after three years, she won her first tournament. Up to now, she's a champion in the Philippines, champion also in international. And now she's training for the Olympic qualifiers of, of uh, karate, hoping to represent the, the, the country. So to your question, is it nature? Is it nurture? I think it's uh, both. Thank you if nature will give you, but it's also a lot of nurture. It's a lot of nurture. And the, the parents also would have to really exercise a lot of discretion as to balance and not really stressing their uh, ch- ch- children out. So for me, maybe for my experience, it's also the same, nature and uh, nurture. That is such a, okay, that's very good advice, um, uh, Darlene, and, and quite an interesting story about your daughter. Now, your daughter, you mentioned studied mathematics, which you know, a bit of a technical program, not not an easy uh, program, most would, would say. Your advice to other young people, what kind of programs would you recommend? Would you recommend others going into law, medicine, these kinds of things? And are there ones that they should stay away from? Would you recommend them go into philosophy or English? Okay. These, what do you recommend? Today's employment opportunities for them. Okay, so my daughter actually wanted to study philosophy. And then I said, uh, you know, um, it's when I studied philosophy, I knew I wanted to pursue law. So uh, when I was uh, trying to look for a role, uh, a job in the market after philosophy, I had a hard time. Okay, so and that meant, okay. Because I stopped after after philosophy, uh, there there was a, a bit of time that I tried to look for a job after college, and I had a hard time. Okay, so I had to finish my master's in philosophy, and then uh, me, I became comfortable in my um, in, in 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 the job market after becoming a lawyer. So for now. My advice would be um, the the skill sets or the the college uh, backgrounds that may be more employable now would still be in the sciences. Humanities are also uh, having a comeback. Uh, what with the financial crisis and the the. Uh, the, the, the world is now relooking at the humanities which have been re- relegated to the background when there was a lot of focus on economics, on uh, engineering, on the defined sciences. Yeah. And uh, even if uh, you know you are able to analyze and have certain answers, a lot of crisis that the world has faced, Uh, has given another chance to review. Maybe we we were taking for granted a lot of the social sciences, a lot of humanities, and a lot of philosophy to understand why we encountered. So I think humanities is is, uh, uh, making a comeback as well. 
So the sciences, I think, will remain to be uh, strong. Um, artificial intelligence, data science, I think information technology uh, will be the, the really the way to go. But the supporting social sciences and humanities should also be a big um, arm as well or pillar in, in the next wave of uh, careers. Okay. And now you had, you know, strong international exposure in, in your career. It's, it seems to me, you, you correct me if I'm wrong. Do you think that's important today, international experience, if, if people... Get it, or, or you think Philippines is gonna can go it on their own, so to speak? What, what do you think? Okay, so I was fortunate because in the my first law firm, uh, Kisumbing Torres was a it's it's Baker and Mackenzie Manila, so it's an office that is part of an international law firm. Uh, if your career track is really um, is to go international. International exposure, of course, early on will be very helpful. So when when other clients from all over the world, uh, when they see that I am from Baker and Mackenzie Manila, so that's a lot of uh, credentials as well. So when they see that I am uh, the chief legal officer for Procter & Gamble, which is also a multinational, that's a lot of uh, reputation as well that added to my, uh, to my credentials. So I would say that um, when you are growing and when you are evolving, uh, the more and the bigger exposure that you can get will always be a big help. Why? Because it also exposes you to so many other things, understanding different cultures, uh, accepting diversity, um, being more open, and you are able to benchmark yourself. You might think that you're the best here, but when you know when you're in a telephone conference with other national other nationals, and you know Filipinos tend to be to be more shy, to be more timid. You're not going to get your voice heard if we continue to you know just be protected in our Filipino culture. So it will open up a lot of skills for you if you get more exposed. And then maybe later on, because I also believe that you can be, uh, you, you have also to be an expert on something. So that's, that was also my advice to my, uh, to my daughter. Look for that field. Maybe if you can be strategic about it, look for that field where other people will say, you know, that's so hard. Don't, don't join that or don't enter that. Don't study that. For me, when other people say don't go in there, don't study that, go there, study that. Because you, were, you will be so few and that you will be the experts in that and the world will always need experts in that. And therefore, uh, you have to continue. You have to continue to study and be the master of that field. That's very good advice. So a bit of a contrarian type of view. So that's interesting. And now, um, Darlene, oh, okay. Now something else that others talk a lot about that I've spoken to is sales experience. Now you are, it seems to me, a naturally convincing type of person. And as a lawyer, you need to be that. But I, I, I don't know... Um, do, did you have sales experience? And do you think sales experience is important for senior management? It seems you did quite well without it. Okay, I, I, I don't have sales experience. Um, my, my exposure to sales was, of course, uh, when I was advising our salespeople in Procter & Gamble. And then uh, we also had like a department that's, similar, that's akin to sales in, in Pag-ibig Fund. Uh, for me, say the skill set of a good salesman is also very important because it's a lot, to me, my view is that it's a lot of external relations. It's a lot of understanding who are your stakeholders, who is your audience, how do you communicate to those stakeholders, how do you convince them? So it, I think that uh, those skills of um thinking clearly, defining clearly your, your strategy, your plan, and then 
actualizing those plans, taking into account the different personalities. You have to talk to a lot of different people. You have to be able to spot when uh, it's already a hard sell uh, and uh, this, is your, this is the market that you have to speak a certain language. So I think that's why salespeople are very effective because they're very good in communication skills and they're very good at, uh, by external relations, I mean, um, you know, the, the skill set of extroverts. So uh, very comfortable working with people, talking to people, and spotting their issues and addressing those issues. So to me, even if you're not in the field, but if you are able to discern, these are the skill set. Uh, that are uh, needed for this kind of function, which is sales, you can try to learn that. Okay, so I didn't have a background, so but I was just observing. Okay, so this is what is needed so that we can sell our programs in Pag-ibig Fund. We have to have a good communication plan. Uh, the message track has to be defined. You have to be always forthright in your answers. And uh, you have to be always accessible as well for the, for the questions of your stakeholders. Uh, and be observant as to, okay, what's my medium? Is it, is it a TV commercial? Is it radio commercial? Is it newspaper printed articles? Is it Facebook? Is it digital media? So you also have to have a lot of advice as to what are the uh, platforms that you're going to take. Okay. Okay, that's interesting. Um, now, with uh, motivation, you're a motivated person. And we could talk about the nature nurture aspect of that. Um, now, what do you think? Uh, how do you motivate people? And do you think motivation is something that people are born with? Or can it be learned? Uh, I would again answer that um, it's, it's a combination of both. Okay, so because okay. I could also observe from children, from small children, that there are really children that are already driven so they know what they want and they are able to express to their parents, this is, this is what I want, I want to wear this dress. And you can also observe other children that mom, mom, dad, what am I going to wear? Or what game are, am I going to play today? So, there are different uh, personalities that you can already observe in young children. So which makes me think that maybe some people are driven differently. Now, it could also be nurtured. So again, uh, uh, people, uh, parents can spot like when their children fail, what will be the reaction of the parents? Do you admonish them a lot? Uh, or do you always tell them, you know, it's okay if you if you if you lost in the tournament, it's okay. But sometimes it's really a very delicate balance. You, you don't want to stress them so much, but you also have to encourage them to not be settled and not be happy with losing all the time. So because uh, now with the advent of uh, you know uh, parents are always reminded. Be understanding, be open, don't don't get angry. I I had to experience that as well because as I said, my daughter was always losing in her tournaments, and there was a time that you know she lost in her in her uh, tournament, and then she. So I was really very sensitive. I didn't know how she would react, and then she said, "Mom, where are we going to eat?" So that was her first reaction, and I said. She's not affected at all. So I thought, why? Why is she not affected? It's it's uh, if parang I I was in, I wanted to imagine that you know if I lost I would feel bad. So how how did I uh, motivate her? So okay, we're we're going to eat. So I I indulged her and then have that conversation of okay, how did you feel? Uh, but of course, this is um, what we can do in order for the next tournament so we don't uh, make the same mistakes. So try to help 
also other people, your children, other people, your team members to visualize where you are going. Okay? So I think that when you set a vision, when you set a dream and you know where you're going, when you get derailed, uh, when you fail in one, there is still a path to take because you have set your vision. So I think that is a very important um, exercise to motivate people. And then uh, we like comparing ourselves with other people. So we also have uh, people who inspire us. And sometimes we use those examples. Look at this person. These were the adversities that, uh, that this person had to face. But look at uh, this person now. If, if you want to, to be that kind of person, then this is the way. So it's a lot of, uh, if you are coaching your team, it's a lot of listening to them. But at the same time, uh, make sure that we don't baby them. And uh, you listen, but at the same time, you, you have to encourage them to try some more. And then address, because address what were the mistakes, were uh, the faults, the areas for improvement. Because if you don't address them, the ending will still be the same. Hmm. Okay. Okay, that's very good uh, advice. And now, Darlene, you mentioned earlier that you, you try to be healthy. What Can you tell us a bit about your various exercise programs, food and, and things, and, and, and what uh, how good you are at uh, maintaining these, these programs? Okay, so when I was growing up, I, I, I shared a room with my mom for a, a period of time. And I was, so I would always uh, witness her dressing up. So she was, I think, 50 at that time. And she was uh, a bit in the big, big side. Okay? And then I said, okay, so that's going to be my body when I'm 50. Okay? So, and then I was uh, quite conscious, a, a conscious uh, young person. And I said, okay, what? What are the, uh, uh, the illnesses that I will inherit from the family? So there, were, there was cancer in, in the father's side, a heart problem in the mother's side. So I was, I was just thinking in my head, so all these are in my blood. Maybe I'm predisposed, but uh, how do you um, try to avoid? So Or maybe delay the onset. So, uh, so exercise is one. So... I started exercising when I was, I think, 20 years old. So I was jogging in the UP Oval. Uh, at that time, jogging and then aerobics was also big at that time. So I was exercising three days a week. And then when I reached my, uh, so I, I tried aerobics. I tried boxing. I tried enrolling in, in the gym because when whenever the company would sponsor the, the employees, I would be, you know, I'm always taking advantage of the freebies in the, in the office. So I would go to, to the gym uh, four days a week. So 30 years old, four days a week, 40 years old, five days a week exercise. Now I'm, I'm 52, so I'm exercising six days a week. But I used to exercise for one hour. Now it's down to 40 minutes a day. And the programs that I uh, follow, so I, I have a lot of, uh, uh, I, I research on, on fitness programs. So I read a lot of fitness magazines and fitness programs. And I ask also my friends from the fitness industry. So uh, there is what, they call now smart training. So you you um, spend less time in the gym, but there is shorter rest in between. So instead of like lifting weights and then rest for three minutes to four minutes, so the rest now is like um, 10 seconds or 15 seconds. So the, the programs that come out now uh, are tailor-fitted for people on the go. So they are also encouraged to do it on a daily basis. So I, I follow it. I converted one of my rooms in the house as a gym. So I have a small gym in the house because that's part of my lifestyle. So even when I travel, I bring my fitness band. So I, ex I exercise inside the room or I jog outside if it's allowed. So uh so my house is also designed according to that lifestyle. 
So first thing in the morning, I go up and I uh, like I exercise bef- uh, early this morning uh, before my meetings, and um, I I that's my principle. I don't want to be the cause of my illness later on. So maybe I will still contract the illness, but they can no one can fault me. Absolutely, very good. Uh, another good part of uh, a good advice and example to others. Um, Darlene, a, a spouse is also, you know, a person who will have a very big impact on a person's life and career. What advice, you know, you're experienced now in these things, <laughs> but what advice would you give young career women when choosing a man to marry? What would you say okay. to your daughter, for instance? Okay, so maybe this topic, Richard, will, uh, I think uh, we can have another podcast, but I'm going to give you an overview, okay? So because uh, I also have a lot to, to, to share. So I got, uh, I got married when I was 27 years old, okay? So and at that time, that was, uh, I think, a good age, or maybe most will consider already late during, during that time. It was in the 1990s, okay? Um, and you are right, choosing a spouse can really um, be a defining, uh, a defining decision uh, in, in one's life. Um, so, and when you are young, of course, you fall in love with a person, you don't tend to be cerebral or strategic about it. You fall in love, you fall in love. So there's no plan that, okay. I mean, if now, if I hear of people planning and becoming strategic about it, I'll be creeped out. But I think many people are uh, trying to be strategic about it. Like uh, really, okay, this kind of person will help me in my career. Or So for me, it's a, it's a, it's a matter of our, uh, emotion with, you know, some kind of uh, reason as well. But principally, it is a matter of uh, of emotion for me. Now, so I, I was married for, uh, uh, so I, I got married in 1995. And then um, I also underwent uh, annulment in the late, uh, so I, I was annulled in 2008. So, and I share that experience. Um, I, I am already prepared to share that experience because it's it's been uh, a long while already and, and for other people also to learn from my experience. Uh, and you can imagine the difficulty of undergoing a, a separation in a Filipino society, Catholic society. There was a lot of judgment or maybe my at least from my, from my perception, a lot of judgment or uh, a lot of, um, of prejudice from people uh, on um, couples who separate, there's something wrong with you or uh, you're not good enough. Or, but during the time that I, uh, all the, the career experiences that I shared, imagine those things, those chapters in my life I underwent, but also I was uh, in a another chapter that was so uh, that that also caused me a lot of pain internally. So it's sometimes it's very hard for people to be experiencing a lot of pain inside and and still yeah. try to be functional. Okay, yeah. but uh, I knew that um, I knew that it wasn't optimal for a family, of course, for a child, uh, most especially. I was always mindful of the impact to my child. And uh, my ex-husband and I were very much conscious and um, that the problem was between us and we wanted to give the best uh, environment still for for our one and only child. And, uh, you know, let me just continue my my sharing in that my ex-husband uh, suffered a heart attack in 2014. Now he is uh, basically wheelchair bound. But I, I say this and I share this because 
um, I am still the one that is taking care of, of him. So I and my daughter are taking care of him. So even if I was not able to fulfill my, my wedding vows because we ended up um, separated, the second best, which is, you know, in sickness and in health, um, I, I was still able, to, I, and I am still able to uh, fulfill that for, for him. Why do I share it? We cannot uh, compartmentalize, of course, the, the, the experiences of people. You know, you're very successful in this or you could uh, uh, succeed in different fields. But we always uh, are aware that beside that or behind uh, those uh, chapters, you also... Um, have to find strength in your personal life so that you can, of course, fu fulfill the other roles that the public uh, is seeing. So I also experienced a lot of challenges personally, but uh, I still stuck to the values that I had, values of respect for my ex-husband. Up to now, I still recognize him as the person who I married Okay, there were things that um, became our issues, but up to now, I respect him, and I think uh, the respect is mutual between us. Now he cannot speak, he cannot see, Whoa. but when I when I talk to him, he gives me that smile. It makes me so happy, and our whole family, and uh, we continue to cheer him on and to pray for him so that he will um, get better. Interesting. Yeah, someone once described you as the best ex-wife in Philippines. <laughs> um, Darlene, did, do you think there's differences in working with men and women when you oversee them? Have you ever had difficulty being accepted as, as a female leader over men? What, what's been your experience? Okay. Um, mm, yes, there is a difference. So even if we say, okay, uh, um, there's no difference. They're the same. They're the the skill sets are are quite different. Okay, uh, and I don't know if it is biologically based or is it uh, dictated dictated by culture. So this is not like to say that all, but most uh, women are more thorough. Okay. More comfortable with details. Okay. Yeah. Uh, men are more general view, um, premise, conclusion. Okay, let's implement. Okay. So women will be wait. Let's take a step back. Let's see. Uh, what if A, B, C? Uh, don't happen. So don't we have an 8.1, 8.2, 8.3, and subsets and whatever. So our, our brains are wired that way. Okay. So we have a lot of um, uh, paths, but we are able still to think holistically. Okay. So men, very simple. Okay. Uh, men uh, are also, you know, when you... Uh, my observation, my observation is that they are they tend to be problem solvers. So when you say something, okay, then this is the solution. So women sometimes say things without asking for some solutions. They just want to say things. <laughs> so so just react or just smile or say really or you know just uh, women just want to say things and they also know how to solve, but it's saying not because they want a uh, solution or an answer. Now, have I experienced, um, like, w w was I denied uh, some role because I, I'm a female? Um, well, I experienced that, that when I was in high school, I was supposed to be, I, I think I was being considered as a top uh, rank in our, in the, in the military training, so in high school. But because in history, there's no female, so I was not given that role. I see. Okay, so I was, I was given the second, 
the second ranking, but they gave me the same number of stars in the uh, in my uniform. So it was kind of uh, a consolation. <laughs> so, but other other than that, I, I was the only female member in the Pag-ibig board. Uh, I I I wouldn't say that uh, I had a hard time. Uh, I I thought it was also an advantage because they and and they they are giving me the feedback because they say when I'm talking to a female leader, I w- I wanted to propose something that is shady, but now I'm not going to propose it because. Uh, I'm embarrassed or I respect you too much. So I, I, I would say it's the, it was an advantage when I was in, in Pag-ibig Fund as the only female member of the board. I see. So your advice to young women earlier in their career is, um, you know, it's, it's, it's easy or not. Well, it's, nothing is easy, but uh, what advice would you give young women in, in their career? Okay. Um, when you either you observe or you are told that uh, this is a role for men, so again, my my contrarian attitude. So don't uh, don't believe that too much. Don't internalize that. So those are like um, warning signals that you know the path may be uh, a path of challenges, but you know. When you have a lot of challenges, then hurdle one at a time. So you don't have to hurdle them at the same time. Okay. And then look for a way on, okay, so how do you how do you attain that role? Okay, so what are the ways? Okay, so and there are a lot of um, uh, a lot of approaches now. So you can uh, ask, you can approach potential mentors. And, and so many experienced managers or bosses are willing to share their, their trade secrets or, you know, if you just approach them, have a 30-minute one-on-one with your bosses, uh, set a goal, uh, don't be discouraged. And when they say that, and, and you, they have to take advantage of the worldview now. In fact, so many big companies are really making it as a policy that their board should be composed of X number of female and X number of male. So, I mean, the, the diversity has to be ensured. So take advantage of that and uh, don't believe uh, others when they say that this is just for a particular gender. So I, I would view it more as skill set. And if you are if you don't have the skill set that is required for that role, then try to develop. Mm-hmm. Okay, good advice. And Darlene, if, maybe if we could get your some of your big picture ideas. You know, you've got a lot of experience across sectors, across geographies. What do you think are some of the big opportunities we'll see for the global economy and in Philippines in particular over the next few years? Do you have any, any uh, ideas about that? Okay, and this is the reason also why I told my daughter, uh, read about data science, okay. read about artificial intelligence, yeah. read about information technology. So I think that the next uh, level will be uh, in, that, in that field. Okay, so data science with all the data uh, that are now available to us. Um, the, the, legal, the legal world is also very dynamic because of the, a lot of ethical issues in handling the data, privacy issues. Uh, so because the world will be evolving towards that, and that will be uh, um, the most valuable resource will be information there will also be a lot of definition of the rights over it and the privacy is being redefined. So I would say uh, that is the new field to really uh, watch out for. Yeah, absolutely. Do you see any threats or have you heard of um, 
threats to people's employment and opportunities that are ahead in the, you know, there's going to be opportunities and there's going to be uh, challenges. Have you heard? Uh, what, what, okay. What? In, maybe in the last um, 10 or 20 years, so they say because of the technology, a lot of roles will be uh, displaced. So like accountants or lawyers or even doctors. So because of the, uh, you know, there are there are programs, there are apps now. You just input the sim the symptoms, and then that app will diagnose for you. So, and we've been hearing this in the in the last ten years, perhaps. But my observation is, uh, it will actually it will reach more people. Like, for example, the underserved might then have access to uh, some kind of medical attention by using these apps, yeah. but still the need for doctors, the need for lawyers, the need for accountants, the need for the people, which AI, of course, is trying to replicate. But I, I would still say that the need for the people to actually make those judgments and to make those decisions in actual practice will still not be eliminated. So it will actually just multiply. The, the work is multiplied. So it will reach the underserved and the unserved. Okay, But yes. the people will still have to be there. Okay. Okay, that's a good point. As for the Philippines, now you've had you know, overall responsibility for a large public sector organization. What do you think are some of the biggest opportunities Philippines will have in particular? And what do you think are some of the biggest challenges? Okay. The opportunities for the Philippines will continue to be um, because of our population. So we, we continue to be a young population. So we the uh, the BPO sector, even if they, 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 it has been threatened, I think will will continue. Yeah. Um, our engineering, aside from just being providers of labor for the factories and manufacturing, will I think have to be complemented by the engineering. So meaning R&D will have to complement our manufacturing because I think we have the capability. So we have to uh, go a notch higher and focus also on the R&D. So R&D plus providing labor for the manufacturer. So let's not be happy with being the laborers for the manufacturing for the factories that are locating here in the Philippines. But I think that we can also offer the capability of R&D and engineering. Um, I think that uh, another opportunity for us is when we try to open up and look at the ASEAN as a market. Okay, So because of the ASEAN integration, so we have to be ready for that and not just look at the Philippines and how do I grow my business here in the Philippines. So we are starting to be one market. And so our talent should be uh, fluidly being exchanged. So we also have to uh, bring to the next level our, our skills because we will soon be benchmark, benchmarked with the talents across ASEAN. Okay. So, um, my, my my view then, for example, in housing is like the Philippines has to have a plan, has to have a map, which we, where will this business, where will the BPOs, where should the BPOs be located? Where should um, semiconductor business be located? Which, which area, which island? Uh, and then what will be, then the, uh, municipalities or the cities beside this city should provide the support uh, services, support such as housing uh, and other support for the labor that will be provided. So there has to be like a plan that is regional 
and national. So now our focus is very much local. Each local government unit, you plan your own. Okay, so this is the business hub. This is the housing hub. Uh, th this is the um, uh, agricultural hub. So I, I hope that we will have a national view for the Philippines, a plan so that all regions could also showcase where their, their, their strengths based on the natural resources and based on geography, and then magnify that as well to being part of ASEAN. So because, for example, uh, are we in the uh, medical tourism, like Thailand has been doing that, but I think our doctors who are uh, very talented, yeah. could we could very much uh, promote also our country to be a competitor of Thailand. So, but our challenge is still and continues to be infrastructure. Okay. It continues to be infrastructure. Our, our uh, Wi-Fi, our communication has to be better. Our traffic has to be addressed so that we stop losing the billions in uh, productivity. Okay. So, I think uh, infrastructure, so basic uh, the basic services for a uh, growing economy. Yeah, that's interesting. We'll have uh, Art Tagade speak in a couple of weeks for another event to get an update on his. He's a secretary of the Department of Transportation and he's really making a big effort. So lots going on there. So it is exciting for the future, Darlene. Darlene, would you ever, you come from a political background and you know, in my view, Peg Ibig was kind of a partly a part-time political uh, position. Would you ever go into politics yourself or is this not something you would consider? Okay. Uh, when I was in Pag Ibig Fund, so the vice president, in fact, when he was still the front runner, uh, he was topping the surveys for, for president. Uh, yeah. There was a time. So remember, uh, maybe that was in 2015. 2014, 2015. So he was always stopping the survey. Uh, he he asked me to, to be his running mate. Oh, I to see. To be his vice president. So it, it was it was mentioned just a um, small part in the news. But uh, yes, he did ask me. I had uh, a couple of family meetings. So I did not reject it right away. I, I thought that uh, my exposure to politics uh, did not make it like uh, an option that I was averse to. So it is something that I am not averse to, but my thought process was, sir, and my answer to him was, I'll help, uh, I'll just help in my own small way to make you president and then just appoint me to a position where I could be of help. So in my head, I was making a distinction between an elective position and an appointive position. So because an elective means that you're, to me, it, you're a politician, okay? So because you're going to convince the voters, you know, you vote for me. And uh, my, my thinking was I wasn't prepared to do that because I, you know, when you ask something also from your funders, uh, who will fund your campaign. Uh, I don't know yet how to navigate. Uh, do you say no to the funders when, ev when you are already elected? Do you, how do you, do you, do you ever say uh, no? Or how is that? So because I wasn't ready, uh, so I, that was my response to the vice president. So to answer your question, my heart is very close to public service. Uh, there was one time that I was offered, again, another role in, in government in, in the past, I think in the past 12 months, even. And again, even if I am very happy with where I am now, I seriously considered it, really considered uh, leaving all the projects that I'm handling now and then saying yes to it. Because when I was in Pag-ibig Fund, I was very much happy doing it, even if I thought that the challenges are 
unnecessary in one's life, but there was some kind of joy that I felt when I am uh, in that in, in a similar role. So I uh, I couldn't say no to a public service role if the if I think that the role is uh, appropriate appropriate for my personality and for my skill set. Okay, interesting. Well, maybe uh, brings me to kind of a final question here, but where would we see you over the next five years, seven years? What would you like to be doing? I mean, you said you haven't planned your career, but I think you're at, you, you know, you have some ideas or where you'd like to be. Where would that be, darling? Okay. Yeah. Correct that I'm not planning, but uh, now I am uh, in independent. I am ha- I have an independent practice, so legal and management consulting. So I have uh, uh, a few clients that I I cater to. So I've been doing this for the, for the last two years. On the side, I am able to teach, so part time, uh, and then. Uh, I was all. I'm also part of this small company. I am part of a digital marketing company. So my try at uh, being uh, an entrepreneur with my with four other co- former colleagues of uh, mm. Procter and Gamble. So we're. I'm very proud. Um, after two years, so now we have. It's it's still small, but now we have like 22 employees. It's growing. It's a good business. So. Um, I do a lot of volunteer work. So what what I like about what I'm doing now is I am able to do all other things that I could not do if I am tied to a full time role. Okay. So, however, if I I just think because I have had also a lot of uh, private sector roles, uh, CEO roles uh, that uh, were also presented to me in the in the last two years. And um, as of now, this is what I choose to do. But uh, I am not closing my doors to uh, the right role. A government role is still open to me. I think uh, if if the if the role is appropriate for me, I think I would consider it. Um, because I'm studying my PhD, academic is also a. Uh, academy is always a, a present uh, uh, fixture in in my life, so so the the short answer, Richard, is I actually am not clear where. So, but it it could be government, it could still be private sector, um, it could be writing a book, or it could be still teaching. So. Uh, I'm I'm trying to improve myself so that whenever I am called again to what that role is, I am prepared. Interesting. Well, it'll be very exciting to watch uh, where you end up in your next uh, situation. But yeah, like you said, what you're doing right now sounds pretty uh, pretty fulfilling. So, Darlene, thank you very much. That was such an interesting story. And I think a lot of people are going to be talking about this for years to come. Um, yeah. So. Thank you. Thank you as well, Richard. So uh, I hope that your listeners would uh, pick up a lesson or two. Um, each one of us is uh, really defining our journey in life. We want to be the best persons that we could become, not only in our professional Uh, careers, but also in our personal life, you know, especially as we mature and as we age, uh, now we're learning that uh, uh, there are so many things that we look at differently now. So when you were younger, you always wanted to be right. Now, you you know, you tend to be kinder and you you tend to choose your battles. Uh, When you were young, you were always uh, pissed and upset and want to say you want to complain but now you're like more calm and okay what can I do how can I collaborate so it's an interesting stage uh, still very productive and still I, I continue to hope to be a part of nation building I love the Philippines like you and Rebecca 
I love our country. Uh, I would be very much glad to contribute again in more meaningful and more substantive and more uh, public uh, way of helping our, uh, our country. We so much would look forward to seeing you do that again. The work you did at Peg Ibig was just amazing, the things I've, I've read about, uh, uh, Darlene. So, yeah, so we'd like to see that in other uh, places too. So we wish you really well with your life and uh, continued success and look forward to seeing you sooner rather than later, Darlene. This, uh, peg, uh, this pandemic has sure messed up people's social lives and us for sure. So thank you again, Darlene. And we'll look, seeing, look forward to seeing you sooner rather than later. And thank you again. Thank you. Thank you, Richard. Send my regards to Rebecca. Thank you. Of course. Okay. Thank you. So that was this edition of Going Deep with me, Richard Mills. And we had just a remarkable session with Darlene Berberame. Was that not just an amazing career and an inspiring background of a person's journey? So. Join us again for the next Going Deep with me, Richard Mills, and lots more to come.